without further ado, we are going to jump into part two of the essence of our communion in Jesus. The essence of our communion in Jesus. We're coming out of Mark chapter 14, uh, verse 12 through 26. And the word of God says this. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations? Somebody say preparations. For you to eat the Passover. So he went, uh, he sent two of his disciples uh, telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the, the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Verse 17, when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve while they were re or reclining at the table eating. He said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It will be better for him if he, if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given things, he broke it and gave it to, the, to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood, of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We talked about last week and gave the example of Esau and his brother Jacob, and how Esau lacked in the essence of his birthright. And because he lacked in that essence, he was easily given over to treating it as nothing when he gave it and traded it for some oatmeal with his brother. And his brother took advantage of it, took his birthright, and ran with it. Amen? And today, we, we were very fond of a saying, you don't know what you have until it's gone. Many of us heard that. Many of us been in that same situation where because of the lack of essence with that particular thing or that particular person, we treated it without regard. We treated it without importance. We treated it as though it had no value. It had no meaning. And so in the end, what ended up happening is we ended up losing that very thing or trading that very thing because we never considered it of utmost importance. In our day and age, we're still making that same trade, and we're making that trade with Jesus. Because we forget the essence of the, of the communion in Jesus Christ, we begin to treat Jesus as he's just another regular old person. We begin to treat what he did as nothing, as though it has no significance, no meaning, no essence. And so we walk and we live our, our lives, we breathe, we move, we make, we create our dreams, aspirations. We live as though what he did had no significance at all. The word uh, essence is defined as followed. It is the most, somebody say the most, significant element, the most significant quality, and the most significant aspect of a thing or person. It is the three things that essence is defined as. And when we lose the element, the quality, and the aspect of a thing or person, we begin to trade that person for anything that we deem more worthy than it, or for that manner, more worthy than that person. And so we trade. 
It happens in marriage all the time. It happens in business. It happens on the job. It, it happens with relationships. It happens in family where we miss the essence of that particular person or thing and we trade it. And we don't know what we have until it's gone. And when it's gone, we tend to beg. We tend to, to, to beg that we had that thing or that person again. We tend to be in depression and, and we shrink back just hoping and wishing, God, just one more chance. One more chance, God. I, I would treat it with respect. One more chance, God. If I can just get that person back, just one more chance. There's people dying by the millions every single day. And without Jesus Christ, they stand before the Lord. And you know what they're hoping and wishing? God, just give me one more chance. One more chance. I'll make you Lord of my life. One more chance, God. I would treat you the way you should be treated. God, give me one more tra chance, God. And I would not just, just let it go like nothing, God. Give me one more chance, God. And I'll live a life for you, God. Jesus gave an example of a real life experience. Many people think it was a parable, but Jesus never used names in a parable. He just left it very vague. But in this particular instance in the gospel, he talked about a poor man named Lazarus and a king. And what ended up happening was they both died. The king ended up going to hell and Lazarus ended up going to heaven. And it was the king who ended up having a chance to see Lazarus. And he cries out to Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, can you please just dip your finger into some water so you can put a couple drops on my mouth? It was a description of hell. It was a description that it was now too late. And what the king traded, he could never get it back again. And he traded his soul. And then he cries out to Jesus, can you send somebody to my family so that they can know about you and get saved so they can have the essence of the very communion of Jesus Christ? And Jesus re responds and he says that they won't even believe even if one rose from the dead. And what was he saying? He was talking about his impending death, burial, and resurrection. And as he resurrected from the dead, many people still refused to believe. And even today, people are still refusing to believe. And there's people in hell right now. They're crying out, Jesus, just one more chance. Jesus, I would take advantage of it. I would live the way you called me to live. I would take advantage, God, of your blood and your body, God. Just give me one more chance of survival, God, and I'll do it the way you call me to do it. But it is too late. They didn't realize what they had until it was gone. And today we have the opportunity to come back to the essence of the communion in Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week we talked about the elements of Jesus in the first uh, in the first part of the essence, the significance of the element and element is defined and can be defined as and is synonymous with building block or something essential on which a larger entity is based. And we talked about this thing called element and his building block in preparation in which they made for the Passover meal during this time that we're talking about in the book of Mark in chapter 14. It's pointing to faith. That in faith we make preparations for Jesus to be Lord and Savior of our lives. That in faith, the essence of his communion, the very element or the building block of our lives with Jesus starts with faith and it ends with faith. It is faith that draws us near to God. It is faith that has us seeking after God, knowing that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and knowing that without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible talked about in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, clean out the old leaven so that you may be or a new batch, just as you are still unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. It is us placing our faith in God, even for the overcoming of sin. It is placing our faith in God and allowing God to cleanse us from the inside out. Amen? The other thing we talked about was Romans 1.17, which declares for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness meaning right standing with God. That is by faith 
from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Faith is a significant element or the building block of our walk with God. It starts with faith and it ends with faith. Amen. Then we went on ahead and we talked about last week, the second thing. And the second thing dealt with the quality. Again, the definition of essence is the quality of that particular thing or person. The significant or the most significant quality of the thing or person. And we talked about Judas and, and how in Judas was sitting at the table during the Passover, eating and being married, married with Jesus Christ and the other disciples. But yet all the while, his heart was intended to portray Jesus. He was in preparation of finding a time, a significant time, to betray the Lord and Savior. And Jesus at this time puts Judas on blast. And he says, one of you will betray me. It is one of you who are dipping your bread inside the bowl with me. And so we talked about the reality of what it must have felt like for Jesus to be in the presence of somebody he trusted, somebody who he deemed as a friend, and yet they would betray him. David, as a typology of Jesus, says this in Psalm 41, 9 in the Amplified Version. It says, even my own close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has list, lifted up his heel against me, betraying me. The pain and hurt that Jesus feels when one of his children betray him. When one of his friends betray him. Jesus told his disciples, I no longer call you servants or, or slaves. I, I call you friends. Why? Because I share with you everything in the will of God himself. He deems us and considers us his friends. And yet, we betray him on a daily basis. It's easy to look at uh, 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 Judas and say, man, Judas sucked. He was, he was the villain. He was a, an enemy of the cross. He was an enemy of Christ Jesus. And yet it's another thing when we recognize that when we look in the mirror, we see a Judas inside all of us. Because all of us on a day-to-day -day basis betray. All of us on a day-to-day -day disobey God. All of us on a day-to-day -day in some form or fashion doubt the promises of God. And in that, and in the reality of that, we deny God and his deity as God. We deny God and his lordship, and we deny God as Savior. Every time we doubt him or betray him or disobey him, we are declining and declaring that, God, your kingship is, is tainted. Your, your ability to save is, is not adequate. Your promises, Lord, oh, they're hard to stick with. It's denying Jesus every day when we operate in this manner, just like Judas did for those three years walking with the Lord. We ended and then said that the, uh, the, the quality or the definition of quality is summed up in the words synonymous to quality, which are a class or a class of person, a grade, right? Grade A, grade B, grade C. And lastly, caliber. Caliber is defined as a degree of mental capacity or moral quality. It's important to understand that the caliber of Jesus was perfection. The caliber, the class, or the grade of Jesus was grade A. Nobody can compare to him. He was and is the best of the best. And yet he laid his life down for the caliber, the grade, or the class of people like you and me. When we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, we see the very insignificance that we have within us. We see the unworthiness. We see the brokenness. We see the sin that taints our lives. We see the very wreckage of a life that we have created for ourselves. And even though life may even seem to be good, in the end, apart from God, it is a life that one day will end and it would have been lived for nothing without Jesus Christ, only to end up in hell. And so in light of that and the essence of the communion in Jesus Christ, it is God showing us as example in Judas versus Jesus that I died for every Judas on the face of this earth. 
And when we come to the communion of Jesus and remembering it, it's remembering the caliber of the Son of Man versus the caliber of a person in us as men and women. And when we contrast it, we recognize the greatness, the mercy, and the grace of Jesus Christ to dare to die, not for good people, but for horrible people, if we're honest. For wicked people. People destined for hell and even deserving of it. And yet Jesus, sitting at the table with his disciples, was the one who will betray him. And yet and still, he would continue to go forward in celebrating and redefining the very Passover in which he was conducting that day. He didn't kick Judas out. He let Judas sit in that chair, and he continued to break the bread and to pass the wine in celebration of what he was about to do, even for the Judases of this world. Amen? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 on down, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I want to go down to the bottom of it at verse 31. So then, as it is written in Scripture, he who boasts and glories, let him boast and glory in the Lord. Why is that important after he begins to describe our insignificance toward him in verses in contrast to his significance, and yet he still chooses us? Because when we think about the very quality or the essence of the communion in Jesus, we're not supposed to think about ourselves in light of ourselves. We're supposed to think about the one who chose us, that in, despite us and our unworthiness, despite us being Judases, that Jesus Christ still died for us. And so therefore, when it's time to glory, and it is time to boast, it is not glorying in our wickedness, it is not boasting in our, in our achievements or what we're trying to do or attempting to do to save ourselves. No, it is boasting and glorying in the Lord who gave his perfection for the imperfect. He gave up his worthiness for the unworthy to make us perfect and to make us worthy by his death, burial, and resurrection. And so as we stand before the Lord, and remember communion and take communion as we did last week. It should never be that we begin to remember ourselves and all our sinful ways and all our wickedness. No, it should be that as we partake and remember communion and its essence of the kind of caliber, not of who we are or who we're not, but the caliber of a person that Jesus is and was. That when we stand before him, even in our day to day, driving the work, living life, going out, coming in, that we remember Jesus and how great he was and is. That we remember his perfection, his unblemished life. He was sinless, meaning without sin at all. He was a perfect sacrificial lamb. He was a perfect being. He was God in the flesh. Perfection to its entirety. No darkness at all. And yet he gave it all to die for us. It is in that remembrance and that quality in Jesus that keeps us in the essence of the communion in Jesus Christ that we remember, not ourselves, but we remember Jesus despite ourselves who went on that cross and died, giving up his own body and his own blood for us. And so there, when we remember Jesus in communion, whether at home as we're praying over our food, McDonald's and trying to get a quick cheeseburger or some chicken nuggets with some french fries and saying, God, thank you for these, for these things, that even then we remember, God, I thank you. I didn't deserve you. I wasn't worthy of you. And I can never do enough good to earn you. And yet you still gave yourself so that I can live. Amen? And so when we boast in glory, may it not be in our own achievements, God have mercy, but may it be in the achievements of Jesus Christ despite our lack of. This takes us to the last essence, which is the aspect, the most significant aspect of a thing or person. 
And so despite the betrayal from one of the 12 disciples, we have come to know as Judas and even the Judas within our own selves and the characteristics that we even carry to this day that remind us of the Judas that was sitting at that very table where Jesus Christ began to change the essence of Passover and create a thing called communion, a communion with God and ourselves and a communion with the body of Christ that he has created on that day. Jesus continues with communion to show the essence or the aspect of our communion in Jesus. Aspect is simply defined as the um, appearance of something. It is to look, to exercise the power of vision. Thank God we can see, amen? But thank God even more that we can exercise the power of vision to see Jesus for exactly who he is and who he's not. To see Jesus for what he has done and what he has done in our own lives. It is the power of vision. Another definition is to see, to become aware of by means of the eyes or to have the power of sight. The last essence of the communion in Jesus Christ is the essence and ability to see Jesus for who he is. We're living at a time where when you bring up the name of Jesus or bring up Jesus, a lot of people have a vague or a clouded vision of Jesus Christ. A lot of people see Jesus as the Savior, but they don't see Jesus as the Lord. It's almost like they're covering a portion of Jesus Christ or one of their eyes, and they say, man, I see Jesus as a Savior who serves me, but I don't see Jesus as the Lord and who I must serve in return. I see a very clouded image of Jesus, a very, uh, a very purport, you know, uh, lack of proportion of Jesus. I see only a, a part of him, but not the totality of Jesus Christ and the very important or the most significant aspects of our Lord and Savior. You see, it's easy to see Jesus as a Savior, but it's a whole other thing to see Jesus as God. See, as a Savior, we can bring him down to earth and keep him as a man who is optional to obey and optional to look at anything higher than just another human being. But it is another thing to exercise the power of vision and to become aware of by means of the eyes or to have the power of sight to see Jesus exactly and who he is, both Savior who became a man to save us from our own sins and hell itself, and also God, perfect in all his ways, omnipotent, sufficient in himself, above all, creator of heaven and earth, the very one who sent himself into this world as God, 100%, and as man, 100%, to die for us. You see, when we only look at God on one side as the man, we tend to think we can control that man just like we try to control another man. But when we see him for who he is fully, the aspect that he is God, see, that changes the essence of the communion. He's not just my Savior. Oh, praise the Lord. He is God. Amen? And so while Passover was celebrated and commemorated to remember what God did for the Israelites in Egypt through a Passover lamb which spared their lives and the lives of their firstborn sons and utilizing this same Passover to allow one to have been able to come to God in a relationship in which the priests, right, after Israel, they were already delivered, they exodus out of there. The priests now became the mediator between God and man. They were the ones who the people will come bring in a lamb or some sort of animal based upon their, their economical levels of, of finances. And that priest will take their, their sacrifice, their offering, go into the Holy of Holies and sacrifice that animal. They would butcher that animal. Blood all over the place. All of it was to point to one day God coming in the form of man in flesh 
who would sacrifice himself. And in that sacrifice, what you see, when you go back in that time of what Jesus went through, there was blood everywhere. When they whipped him with that cat of nine tails, every whip whoosh, whoosh, would rip a piece of his flesh off. He was butchered, very similar to the butchering of the animals in the Old Testament. He had the crown of thorns on his head as a means of a king. He had that spear go into his sides and puncture his side where water and blood came out of. He had the, the, the nailing of his feet or his hands and his feet on that cross. What we have to understand is that when that sacrifice was given in the Old Testament, they would put that sacrifice on the altar. But just like any living sacrifice, they tend to try to jump off that altar. And just like us, when we try to say, God, I sacrifice, I give you my life, what ends up happening is we still have a free will to jump off that altar and say, okay, God, not today. But what they would do is, in that altar, they would have hooks that would hook into the animal to keep that animal on that altar. You see, and those hooks would have been symbolic for the thorns or the nails going into the hands and feet of Jesus that would keep him on that cross, not that he was trying to get off. But all of it is to say that everything that was happening in the Old Testament was all pointing to the Lamb of God who would come and take away the sins of the world, or for that matter, die for the sins of the world. You see, when we understand what God did, being God in Christ Jesus, 100% God and 100% man, and giving up of himself because no other man on the face of the planet or animal was worthy enough to die for themselves, let alone to die for anybody else. God came in a, in a form of a man in flesh and blood and say, I will sacrifice myself so that they can live and be saved. You see, that's why the essence of the communion of Jesus is so important. Because it's not just some man coming and doing what some man did. No, it's God himself coming in a form of a man and doing what no one else can do. He did so that we can have a relationship with God, not based upon our own works, but based upon the finished work of God on that cross. And it was not that God died because God cannot die. It was the body that died, that God dwelt in. Amen? It was that that died, and that body was buried, and God resurrected that body on the third day because God cannot die. Amen? And so in light of that, here they go practicing the tradition of the Passover on this day that they celebrated, they commemorated, and they remembered that would all point to the actual Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, its purposes, would be for all to look at. Somebody say, look at. And see. Somebody say, see. Jesus. See, all of it from the Old Testament, all the way back even to Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, how were they still able to have a relationship with God and getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Because God sacrificed an animal that day. And remember he said, he then wrapped animal skin around Adam and Eve to cover their shame, right? Which was the, the shame was sin because they had sinned against God and ate that little fruit, whatever it was, kanepas or whatever y'all like from y'all own hometown, whatever it is, right? That fruit, right? What is it? Right? There it is, right? Well, whatever side, whatever you like, watermelon, mangoes, whatever it is, right? Whatever fruit you want it to be, it was some kind of fruit on a tree. They ate it and they sinned against God. And see, God had to cover their shame. He couldn't remove their shame. He had to cover it. Where do you think this skin came from? Just a random skin just laying on a tree, just shed? No. He had to kill an animal, sacrifice it, take the skin off that animal and wrap it around Adam and Eve. That was the first sacrifice of the whole Bible, and it pointed to one day where God would come in human likeness and human flesh to die for our sins 
and not to cover our sins and wrap ourselves up with some human skin. Come on, somebody. But it was to remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. Amen? That is what Jesus did. And so we, it was all pointing to Jesus so that we can look at and see Jesus as the mediator and atonement of sin and Lamb of God or God-man who would allow all to have a relationship with God who looked unto Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. Jesus would usher in the forgiveness of sin through the payment of his body and his blood that was broken and poured for all men. Why is Jesus so significant? It's because only through Jesus and his blood that we receive the forgiveness of sins. It's not about how many push-ups you can do, how many Hail Marys, how many times you can go into somewhere, a little closet, and talk to somebody. No, it was about Jesus Christ and his blood. It is the only way we can be forgiven of our sins and the only way to heaven. Amen? It is through the Lamb of God who took away and paid for the sins of the world for all who would believe in him. Jesus would usher it in and pour out for all of us for the payment of sin upon that cross, fulfilling the old covenant that demanded full obedience of, in which no one was able to keep fully, and which demanded blood as his judgment. The old covenant was a covenant. Covenant meaning a promise. It could not be broken. It was stronger than your covenant with your house right now. It was stronger and is stronger than your covenant between the car you may be paying for right now. It is stronger than even the covenant of marriage right now. That marriage license, it is stronger than that. It cannot be broken because it's a covenant between God who cannot lie. It was a covenant that was binding. And the only way for that covenant to be fulfilled or for that manner abolished, it had to be by blood. Someone had to die. And so the old covenant was a covenant that we had to produce perfection. We had to keep the laws of God, the commandments, not just the 10, but the 613 laws that was in the Old Testament. All of them had to be kept perfectly. There were individuals in, in, in the past who attempted to say, man, I'm going to try to keep the laws perfectly. And they only started with the 10 commandments. And they would realize, man, today I fulfill this. I didn't put nobody else before God. But then as they began to examine their life of that day, they recognized, wait a minute, but I broke this law down here. And while I was trying to keep this law, the whole time I was breaking these laws down here. And so they recognized it was impossible to keep the very laws of God perfect. Impossible. And that was the point. The point was that nobody in this room can adhere to perfectly to the law of God. It was given so that we can recognize and see the need of a Savior. And not just any Savior, but a perfect Savior. A Savior who had to be God himself, all perfect, all holy, no darkness, no blemish, who would come to die for us. And his name was Jesus. Amen? The Bible says in Galatians 3.24 in regards to the law, this is the New Testament for everyone. Thus, the law was like a babysitter for us, looking after us until the coming into the coming of the Messiah, so that we might be given covenant membership on the basis of faithfulness. But now that faithfulness has come, we are no longer under the rule of the babysitter, the babysitter being the law. For you are all children of God through faith in the Messiah, Jesus. The purpose of the law was only to show us and be a babysitter to us that lets us know, son, daughter, man, woman, you are in need of a savior. This law cannot save you. This law can only show you how much you need saving. That when we look at our life, we recognize, wait a minute, I can't be perfect. I'm an imperfect person. And every time I try to do good, I seem to do even more bad. Every time I put uh, boundaries in my life, I seem to break them every single time. And so all of it is, is a remembrance that we are in need of a Savior. It was for this reason Jesus declared and commanded, take, eat, this is my body. Amen? Considering the cup, he declares, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. 
in which Matthew's account adds in Matthew 26, 28, for the forgiveness of sins. This is a new covenant in which God uh, orchestrated and created through the very death and burial and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And it was because of him that we were able to be saved. The next thing it says, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 says this, when in regards to the new covenant, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. You see, when an individual says there is no God, it takes some grit. It takes some deception. It takes a lot of futility of one's mind or loss into this abasement that an individual says there is no God because they are going against the very nature inside of them that says there is God. And yet they go against it, even though you can look around and tell there has to be a God. Some people draw off of evolution and the Big Bang. But if you haven't been keeping track of what's been going on in the news or for that matter in these videos with scientists, they sent out this, this, uh, this large, um, what is it, like a, a microscope or a telescope? I forgot the name of it, right? You guys can look it up on YouTube. It's, it looks gold and it goes on. But they wanted, because they wanted to see what was the beginning. They wanted to look in the future, in a sense, future to look at their past. And when they put this big old telescope out there, right, what they found was this. It messed up the whole scientific background because it only confirmed this thing, that there was no evolution or Big Bang. Because in the telescope, they began to recognize that, wait a minute, how is it there a Big Bang? When we go back and we're able to look in eons in, in, in a future, for this matter, in the past, they're able to see galaxies that were formed or that, that should not be there. There were small galaxies and large galaxies, and it only proved that the Big Bang Theory was a complete lie. It was a complete lie. It proved that somebody put us here, that somebody put those galaxies there, because a Big Bang Theory is a Big Bang, and it goes out. So if something is going out, how do you have a small galaxy next to a large galaxy at the very beginning of this thing called the Big Bang? It is impossible. It would have formed differently. And so it only proved that the evolution of a Big Bang Theory is completely false. But what it does prove is that there was a sovereign God who put everything in its place in perfection. And it was the God of the universe. Amen? And so here it is. God put it in our hearts that everybody would know that there is a God. And to go beyond that is to go beyond just the logic in itself. Amen? And so we're talking about the essence of the communion in God, in Christ Jesus. To be able to look and to see Jesus for exactly who he is, the Savior and the Lord of all. There are three aspects in this new covenant that the new, co uh, the new covenant, that the new covenant is showing us in light of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. And it is this. The first one is internal change in verse 10. You see, we're all looking for some kind of change. And we lose sight, or when we lose sight of the essence of the communion in Jesus, we lose sight of the one who actually changes us. And what begins to happen is that instead of looking and seeing Jesus, we begin to look at ourselves, and we begin to try to live good enough. We begin to try to change enough. We begin to try to have some kind of internal change that leads absolutely nowhere when we recognize we can't change ourselves. But the essence of the communion in Jesus is to recognize that internal change doesn't come from us. It comes from God. And his death, burial, and resurrection is a reminder that I can never change myself to be saved. I must come to God in faith in the first element that God is able to save me and change me on the inside out and make me born again. 
when we lose sight of the aspect of the communion in Jesus, we lose sight of the one who actually changes us, that we begin to try to change ourselves. And you know what happens? Every time we remember or come to the communion of Jesus, we are so discouraged to practice what God commanded us to practice because we're so busy looking at ourselves. We're so busy looking at the internal change or the lack thereof. And we begin to, uh, how we say, like become depressed. We begin to fall under condemnation. And you know what happens? We can't even partake in communion because we're so condemned and we're so discouraged because we're no longer looking at Jesus and seeing Jesus. We're too busy looking at ourselves and seeing the lack of change that we have in our lives. But what God is telling us is through the word is that when we look at the aspect of Jesus in the essence of communion, we're able to see the one who changes us and why he changes us in light of his life that he exampled for us. Amen. The second thing that we see in Hebrews verse 11 is relationship. He said, I will be called your God and you will be my people. The essence or the aspect of communion is to be in Jesus is to be able to see Jesus who gave up himself and poured his own blood for the forgiveness of sins. But even beyond that, it's so that we can have a relationship with God, a genuine relationship with God. That the essence of our communion is in Jesus is an essence that Jesus brought us a relationship with himself. That he is now our God and we are his people. And in that relationship, we're able to have true relationship with one another. Amen? And the final thing that he says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, is the forgiveness of sin. He ends it by saying, I would forgive you of your sin and remember them no more. You see, all three of these things that Hebrews talks about, internal change, a relationship, forgiveness of sin, all comes from the aspect or the element of our communion in Jesus Christ. That when we stop looking at Jesus as the aspect and when we stop looking at Jesus as the one who finished it all, we will begin to start looking at ourselves and the lack of change, the lack of relationship. And we will begin to, to, instead of being remembered that our sins have been forgiven, we will begin to remember our sins as though Jesus remembers them too. See, in that last verse, he says, I would forgive them of their sins. And not only that, but I will remember them no more. These three, these three things reflect how we lose sight and lose the aspect of Jesus in communion. You see, there's plenty of people that said, man, I tried that Jesus stuff. I tried it, and I just stood the same. Nothing changed. Nothing happened to me. Well, could it be the reason why? It's because you didn't look to Jesus for change. Instead, you try to change yourself. You were looking for some self-help, some kind of self-motivation self-identity, rather than looking to Jesus for eternal change and looking to him and who he says you are, rather than letting the world or yourself tell you who you are. Because when we look at Jesus as the aspect of our communion in him, we will be able to recognize that he is the one who changed us. He is the one who gives us our identity. He is the one who leads us and guides us. When we feel like we don't have a relationship with God, it's because we have stopped looking to God for that relationship. And when we start falling into condemnation and start remembering our sins, it's because we forget the one who died for our sins. And what begins to happen is that every day through condemnation, we have guilt, we have shame, and we tell ourselves, I'm not good enough. We remember our sins, and it begins to affect us. And what does it do? It takes our eyes off of Jesus, and it places it on the very thing that's bringing us shame and guilt. And you know what that does? It causes us to walk away from God. The very one who died so we can be forgiven, can have a relationship, and can uh, uh, experience true change within us, we walk away from. We take our eyes off of him. And this is where Jesus ends this time of communion with them. He ends it the same way it's supposed to start, with Jesus Christ. 
And so when we fail to understand the essence of the aspect of our communion in Jesus that causes us and cause us to look and see him as the aspect of our communion, we fail to realize that it is him we must look to that gives us eternal change. It is him that is the aspect of our relationship and our relationships. And it is Jesus who is the one we must look to as the aspect of our forgiveness and the forgiveness of our sin. Therefore, the aspect of our communion in Jesus is an aspect that does not look to ourselves as the one in whom creates eternal change, relationship between God and us, or the one in whom must do or to be forgiven of sin. But rather, it is for us to look to Jesus as the aspect of our communion in Jesus through himself. He is the pioneer and the author and finisher of our faith. It is all about Jesus, and it comes down to Jesus. It starts with him. It ends with him, and he is everything in between. And in verse 25, Jesus declares that he will not drink again from the fruit of the vine. Going back to Mark chapter 14, verse 25, until that day when he drinks it new in the kingdom of God, in which Matthew's account again adds, drink new with you. This is to say that Jesus and Jesus alone are and must always be the essence of our communion until we have communion with him again in the kingdom of God. For this reason, as the disciples and Jesus did, as was their tradition, remember it ends and it says they sung hymns and then they departed back to the Mount of Olives. What were those hymns? What did they sing? Was it Maverick City Music? Was it Jesus' culture of the time, right? Was it something that they just made up? According to tradition, they sang Psalms 115 to 118, those chapters. Chapters 115 to chapters 118, that is what they sang. What are these psalms? And why would they end in this? I believe it is for this reason right here. In 115 of Psalms, It is putting God first in our lives and complete faith. When you read that psalm, that's 115. Psalms of worship and thankfulness of God in whom we can never repay for what he has done is Psalm 116. Psalms of praise for God's unlimited love is Psalm 117. And psalms of confidence in God's unchanging love that gives us security to continue to look to him is Psalms 118. We, too, must continue to sing songs to the remembrance and glory of the Lord, considering the essence of our communion in Jesus and all he has done for us through his death, burial, and resurrection that gives us internal change, a true relationship with him, and the ability to be forgiven of all and any sin as we live for him. You see, it's not some sins. It's all sin. And he's able to remember them no more. Amen? Today, may the essence of our communion be a reminder of the element of our faith in Jesus to do what he has done in rescuing us from the bondage and slavery of sin. To the very reminder that it is not based on the quality of a person that we are, but based on the quality of a person, capital P, he is who provided the payment for our sin that allows us to be forgiven of the very sins we have committed and changed to the person. He is to help others who are dealing with the Judas in them. And lastly, it is to be reminded that our aspect or look and sing must be unto Jesus and Jesus alone who gives us internal change and relationship between God and us and forgiveness of our sins. Today's challenge is this, is may the essence of our communion in Jesus be understood and experienced in the significance of the elements of faith the quality of Jesus and not the quality of ourselves and the aspect or the looking and seeing 
of his person and not our own. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for his grace and his mercy found in Jesus Christ. Amen. If you guys are grateful for what Jesus did, can we stand and clap unto Jesus Christ and worship him in closing tonight? Amen. Can we all?